All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Shared Spaces, Community Gardens, and Composting. Uh, my name is Randall Penn. I am with the University of Florida Extension here in Sarasota County, and I am joined by... My name is Mindy Hannock, and I am the Community and School Garden Coordinator for Sarasota County Extension. Well, just today's agenda, you can see it kind of spelled out in the slide here. We did our welcome introductions. We're going to talk a little bit, or Mindy is uh, going to talk a little bit about her community gardens program. Uh, I'm then going to kind of go into some of the composting programs we have here at the extension. And then we'll both kind of go back and forth of steps to be successful um, at implementing either a community garden program or a composting program. We have a few examples that we've worked with around the community. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to kind of answer some of those questions. We have a small group too. So if you have questions, just kind of type them in the chat as we go. We're happy to kind of answer them um, if we're not specifically going to address it later on. And with that, I think you're up first, Mindy. Take it away. Thanks, Randy. Um, so when we talk about community gardens, basically it's a shared space for people to garden. Um, and typically they're growing vegetables. Uh, and there's a few different, there's a couple different kinds of community gardens. So um, the ones in Sarasota County um, that are part of our program, the seven that we have um, are located in our county and city parks and they're allotment or plot gardens. So basically a member when they join, they're, um, they're given a plot uh, to maintain and then they contribute to the, maintain, the maintenance garden space. Over. Um, and then the, the is usually voluntary and so I'm grateful for our volunteers that keep the gardens up and running and are the boots on the ground. And then the other kind of garden, um, I have a tendency to refer to cooperative gardens collectively as school gardens. Um, and they might be at a community center, they might be at a pre-K pre site, after school site, um, but they're growing cooperatively, meaning they may be planting together um, harvesting together and then, um, you know, it's more of a cooperative effort, uh, shared planning, uh, shared harvest, and that type. Of so that, um, sometimes you might come across something like that and then the, the, the food is donated um, uh, or that type of thing. Um, it does rely heavily on volunteer engagement because um, if it's very open and people can harvest at will, but they don't have to participate in the process, um, sometimes you might lose uh, engagement from the folks that have done most of the work. So one of the reasons we're talking about composting and community gardens is that uh, it's, it's to help address food security. So if we were looking at some of our local numbers when we're talking about um, the All Faiths Food Bank in our area, um, they do a wonderful job um, providing food uh, to the community. And the numbers that we have for 2020, so like eight over 8 million pounds of fresh produce was distributed um, as part of uh, the meals that they provided, which was amazing. Um, and then, but that's still a portion, if you hit the button for me, Randy, um, so if you're looking at the, the my plate, the food pyramid went away quite a while ago and it's been my plate where your fruits and supposed to be half of your plate. So of that 8 million pounds out of the 22 million pounds, it's still not that 50% uh, of the recommended allowance. So um, empowering people to be able to grow their own produce um, is something that can help address that food security. So community gardens in that way can step in. Um, and it's really relevant as um, I know in our area, we see more development and sometimes uh, people are either restricted from growing their own food. They don't have a yard. Um, they may be renting and the landlord doesn't have to dig up the turf or they're in an apartment. Um, and so having access to a space where they can grow food um, is important. And, one of the reasons there is there can be issues with food security is that if 42% in, in Sarasota County, and this number's probably uh, adjusted a little bit since then, um, with because um, our, our market has gone 
has done really well, but that does impact what people pay for housing. So 42% of households were paying more than 30% of their monthly income in their housing costs. And so then it kind of stands to reason that the more that you're paying on your housing, the less you have um, to access for uh, purchasing groceries. So um, so it's, it's a good thing to have uh, gardens where people can come in and grow their own food. So in addition to sharing a physical space where people can come in and grow, um, a lot of times people like to join community gardens because they're sharing knowledge with um, fellow gardeners. Um, they're getting some of that local Florida growing experience, which uh, a lot of us lack when we first get to Florida, because um, there's a little bit of a learning curve here um, between um, the difference in the seasons and the difference in our soil. And they also like the idea of uh, sometimes they may be harvesting and they have a little more of something than what they wanted and they kind of swap or share. Um, so they have an opportunity to kind of uh, try new things, um, learn about different varieties of plants um, and, and different tricks of the trade, if you will. So, uh, so having a shared space, you're also um, you know, sharing that knowledge and, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, so there's some quotes on there. Um, from some of our folks that engage in the community gardens and the pictures are from our community gardens. And um, one of them on there was, you know, being able to grow enough food to give some away. And then of course, um, there's someone that they were so excited about being near one of the community gardens that they looked for a home near the community garden. So that's pretty, um, they're, they're valuable in the community. Um, so benefits of gardening. Um, if you're engaging in gardening at like, two to two and a half hours a week. Um, it's like a moderate form of exercise. So there's health benefits that way. Um, and then not only are you being outside and being active um, and having the health benefits of exercising, but then you're also getting that fresh produce from it as well. Sorry about that. Um, so frequently you'll see like a decrease in depression and anxiety, mood disturbance, stress, and BMI. And then you're gonna have an increase in things like quality of life, cognitive function, physical activity levels, sense of community. Um, and I know some of our gardeners, some of them are in their uh, 80s and even into their 90s. Um, and I can't keep up. So there must be something uh, good going on um, with that nice exercise and fresh produce. And so when I did survey um, our community gardeners, those that responded cited 99% of the, of the people responding had benefits in either physical activity, healthy eating, economic benefit, or a sense of well-being resulting from participating in the community garden. And I want to say it was either over 80 or almost over 90% where someone had a benefit in each of those categories. So um, it's a pretty neat space. It kind of checks a lot of boxes of um, value. And Randy, can, can you share more about composting? Because we've been talking about food security and that kind of lends into food waste. Yeah, so, so the, the programs I do uh, ma mainly here deal with waste reduction strategies. And wasn't that cool? The owl kind of turned and just focused on me there. And so it's working pretty good. So you're saying uh, I should talk and make it bounce back and forth a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But I always like to, you know, one of the issues that we really started to address not just here locally or across the state of Florida, but it, it's it's really a, a national and even global type uh, issue. I was on a uh, conference this week and the big topic of discussion was all about food waste um, and all the issues that are associated with that. And I like to think that food waste really is these three things. And this is from the Department of Agriculture. It's excessive, it's expensive, and then it's environmentally harmful. Um, so it's a pretty good graphic. I, I think it outlines it pretty good. It's excessive in the sense that we waste 40% of all the food that's produced in this country. You know, that equates to 133 billion pounds. Um, it's expensive, you know, as, as each, each home here in the United States um, throws away over $1,500 of food per year. And then, and then there are these environmental impacts that are associated with our wasted food. And to kind of, you know, I don't really understand when they say 133 billion pounds, what that means, you know, it's such a big number. Uh, but essentially, we throw enough food waste away here in the United States to fill up our football stadium here in Gainesville uh, at the swamp twice a day or 730 times a year. So, you know, twice a day we're filling up that stadium. It's a lot of food waste 
that we're producing uh, across the country. And I saw someone here was from Austin, Texas. I know that's a, a big issue down in Austin, Texas. And they're actually been one of the few cities that's actually had some success with some, uh, you know, curbside and, and commercial type composting. Uh, so I'm always kind of watching what's going on in Texas. They, they're, there's a few companies that are kind of addressing that sort of thing. Uh, so I know they're very interested in the issue uh, over there. It's good to hear. Um, you know, we, we go out and this is, a, this is from enough, some stuff from Sarasota County, but it pretty much is standard for any mid to large size city across the country. Um, you know, when they do these audits of what goes into the landfill, they find that a quarter of it, 25% of that material is organic in nature. Um, you know, what do we mean by organic? Well, it's going to be food waste, which makes up a majority of that component, but it's also, you know, compostable paper paper, different types of paper packaging, um, yard waste gets into a certain level, and all those type of things can actually be, you know, composted, or I like to think of recycled, right? And so we're all, we always are looking for increased recycling rates, and this would be one way to really up that if we start doing more uh, recycling. And the other thing of note is most people think that the food waste is produced commercially, from restaurants and things like that. But that's not actually the case. What we found is more of it is produced by homeowners. Um, we have a lot more homes here in, in Sarasota County than businesses, and they contribute to, you know, a little bit more of that amount uh, as compared to the, uh, to the restaurant and businesses for food waste. So as residents, we can have a big impact uh, by reducing our food waste or even composting it. Uh, you know, I always like to put something in the chat. I think some of you probably know what, what composting is, but if you want to kind of put in what you, your concept or what your thought about composting is, uh, I'm always kind of interested in how people define that. You know, so many people think of it different ways. And I would even say, you know, if you are going to compost, you know, what do you plan to use it for? It'd be a good thing to type, type in there as well. Uh, one of the classes we do here locally, though, and in your area, I bet they do something similar. Um, if you want to really get involved with composting on a, a hands-on type approach, we call it let's make some black gold here. Um, the great thing is I just scheduled live classes. We're getting ready to go here and opening up again. So it's great because composting really lends itself to that. It's one of those classes you can learn by doing. And in that course that we run through the extension, we'll, learn, we'll discuss the issue of food waste, which I just kind of glossed over a little bit. Um, but then we're going to get into the basics on how to build a pile, you know, um, different types of bins that you need to do, how, you know, what goes in, what types of food that you put in, and ultimately screening and application of your compost when you're finished. Uh, for those of you who put something in the chat, you know, this is the definition. Uh, composting is the controlled decomposition of organic material by microorganisms. Um, you know, it's a mixture that has the uh, decayed organic matter. In our case, though, we're going to kind of combine a few ingredients and kind of put together a mixture of the browns and the greens or the carbon and the nitrogen sources. And we do that in a controlled setting with the goal of creating a fertilizer, a natural fertilizer. We want to condition our soil. In Florida, we have very, very sandy soils. I'm I know the community garden, I don't know how they can grow anything. I, my stuff, I, I just, I have, I struggle. Um, but, you know, you, they use a lot of this type of compost in that process. Not only does it help fertilize, but it helps retain moisture as well. So, you know, it's not just draining that water through. It helps to kind of reduce the impacts on there. And another thing I always like to put in there, even if you're not a gardener, even if you're not going to use it in your yard or something like that, um, you're still diverting the food that's going into the landfill, which reduces some of those environmental impacts associated with it. And what I like to call it recycles it, right? So there's no excuse not to get involved. You don't have to just be a gardener to do composting and be a uh, good steward of the environment. You know, this, this is just a, a basic graphic that kind of shows what goes in your bin. Um, we're gonna have our browns, which is our carbon rich material, right? Uh, we're going to have our greens, which is going to be our nitrogen-rich material, which is our food waste that we're going to put in there. And then we're going to add uh, also into that a mixture of water. We want to keep it nice and damp. 
And then the, an important ingredient of this is the air. You know, you want to go and turn your compost or fluff it up occasionally to create air pockets and voids in there because uh, composting is an aerobic process. And when you think about aerobic, think about, you know, aerobic exercise. So when we go out and we exercise, we take in a lot of oxygen, we take in a lot of air. Um, that's what's kind of happening with your compost uh, here, you know, and when we do that, our temperature, body temperature heats up, right? When we're out exercising, same thing happens with your compost. When you build your pile, it's going to start off at the ambient temperature of what's outside today. It's pretty hot and humid here in Florida, but maybe in the 80 degrees. But if you build it correctly with the right ingredients there on top, um, you're going to attract two things. You're going to attract macroorganisms, which are your kind of the insects and ants and millipedes and different things like that. But more importantly, you're going to attract microorganisms. These are the bacteria that we can't see, and they actually do the work in the compost. They're the ones that kind of break down, and they need that oxygen to survive. Uh, just a couple things quick on, on the composting. Um, the browns that I mentioned, um, you can use what you have available. Um, you know, in our area here in Florida, we do have a lot of oak leaves. I have a lot of mulch here that I use. Uh, I think it's chipped up. That's easy to use. Um, you're probably, you know, you need to have a lot of the brown material. It's going to make up the bulk of your composting bin that you select. You know, by volume, it's usually about two thirds of the component of your of your bin. You know, so whether it's leaves or straw or mulch or some level of pine needles, create that mixture in there, and, uh, and it's going to make up that bulk of, of your thing. I like to think of it as the shelter. Um, so it's like a home. That's the main bulk of, of your composting bin. Uh, the second component uh, in my courses that I do, this is where I get most of the questions. You know, what food can go in the, into my bin? Um, you know, the food waste is going to be that nitrogen component that breaks down. It's going to be in a smaller volume uh, uh, than, than, the, uh, than the browns are going to be. So you don't want to just load up your bin with food and more food and more food. It's going to turn into kind of a soupy mess. And it's not, never going to create that nice compost material. You need to create the right balance. Um, I like to think of the analogy of the, of the house. Uh, in the shelter, we have a very, you have a big house, that's the browns, that's the shelter, and you have a small refrigerator. That's the food, that's the nitrogen. So big house, lots of browns, small refrigerator. When you kind of reverse that and get those out of balance, that's where you're going to kind of run into some trouble and not, and not, not, not create that nice material. Um, underlined here too is a good rule of thumb. Food from plants is okay if it's from an animal stay away, right? We don't want to use meats. We don't want to use seafood. We don't want to use, you know, steak and fatty and greasy items. Uh, we want to stay away from dairy items from cows. We don't want to put those, those items in there, lots of cheese. Um, what happens is those items spoil. And when they spoil, the bacteria really don't want to break that stuff down. It will break down eventually, but because of that spoiling, it's going to smell and it's gonna attract pests. Um, so in a backyard setting, we definitely don't wanna put any of those materials in it. Now, inevitably, when I, when I mentioned stay away from the animal, someone usually types in, what about eggs, right? Because they are produced from an animal, chickens, right? And different types of, of birds. Um, you can put in eggshells. Um, I would suggest to just rinse them off quickly before you do it, just to get some of that material out of there. Um, but they, they won't harm your uh, compost at all, but you definitely don't want to put in uh, any of the goop and eggs and stuff like that. Uh, someone wrote that doesn't grain have a tendency to track rodents? And yeah, it, it can. Um, if you put large amounts of grains or, or even, you know, I know some guys who do some spent grains from home brewing, lots of stuff, and that stuff can kind of, kind of, be too much volume, you know. Um, down here in Florida, though, when we put our breads in and, and you get it wet and incorporate it in, it tends to break down really quickly, and so we don't have a lot of problems with that. But if you are in an area where you maybe are up against the woods or see a lot of those type of animals nearby, you might want to, you know, try to have a more balanced amount of food that you put in. And and then the other thing is, I would 
I would cover it up with the brows. You'll never go wrong if you if you incorporate and cover it with more browns. That you'll be safe that way. Over kind of over put the browns in there if you're concerned about that. So I have a qu couple questions. Yeah. So, um, so speaking of the animal piece, and then I would say, so from like a community garden perspective, um, sometimes when it comes to things like bread, it depends on whether folks are gardening organically and what kind of bread they're eating as far as whether or not they want to put it in the bin. Um, and then also, um, sometimes people really love uh, using manure. Um, and when you're in a community garden, not everybody's planting and harvesting at exactly the same time. And so there can be a food safety component. So if folks are incorporating manure in a community garden or a composting scenario, I still wouldn't put fresh manure into community compost. That would need to be pre-composted. So, um, and it, so if you're in an area where there are composting programs, you just kind of want to ask for distinctions on uh, what is and isn't okay um, and, and take good guidance from, from Randy for that. Yeah, that, absolutely. So, so manure is one of those kind of tricky items. And if you are in a community setting, you definitely want to have, have a plan in place that says these are the items we accept and these we do not want you to put in. Um, you know, I get a lot of calls about horse manure. <laughs> it's unbelievable uh, how many calls I get on that because it's problematic, you know. Um, we have a lot of uh, kind of small farms down the road here, and people have five or ten acres and a couple horses, and they want to know what to do with it. Um, you do not want to incorporate that horse manure into the community composting. You kind of almost want to compost that on its own, on your own land, um, because they can have problems with seeds and digestion, and, and there's some problems yeah. with some pathogens. Exactly. Um, you know, you can use uh, anything from an herb herbivore. You're okay. Um, you know, cow manure is going to be okay to put in and, and things like that. But I'll still eat it first. Yeah, I mean, per, you know, if you have it on your, available to you on your land or something like that. But uh, you definitely want to stay away from the carnivores and omnivores that eat meat because um, they can have a lot of those pathogens, like you say. That's a, that's a whole other uh, whole other course there. Oh yeah, and then I have a question for you. And, yeah. So if somebody has a whole vegetable plant that's green when they pull it, is that a green or a brown? Yeah, so it's going to, everything contains um, carbon and nitrogen. It's all about the level and the ratio. So something like that may, when you, when you pull it, may have a, anywhere from a 10 to 20 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, you know, that's kind of in the same range as like fruits and vegetables. So when it's first pulled, like grass, it is considered a green just because it has those higher levels and it's not really woody and it's not like a twig or stick. Um, maybe the stalk of it might not be quite as much if, it, if it's like a hard stalk, but it's going to be that way um, and it'll break down. I would say, you know, at my community composters here, people will put that whole plant in. Right, so if you are doing that, I would try to break it up into smaller pieces because it's not going to incorporate really well. It's going to cause some kind of some problems for everyone else. So you know, the more surface area you create with that material, the better off it's going to be. But to kind of circle back, it's still considered a green, although it may not as it dries out and, and depending on the plant, it's not a high level, you know, nitrogen source. But it, it but definitely break it up. Um, so that our microorganisms can break it down. And this is what we want to attract to break it down. That's why we need to create the proper balance in our bins to create, so we can attract these, uh, what I call the cypros, the mesos, and the thermophilic bacterial, bacteria. The number two there, the mesophiles or mesophilic bacteria, these are what do the majority of the work of your bin. They operate in kind of that 68 to low hundreds type ranges, which is where you're going to be with your bins almost 90% of the time. Um, so that's why you'll see your compost start to go up after you start to build. If you take the temperature, it'll go up 80, 90, 95, maybe 105 degrees within the first few days. You've attracted these type of bacteria. If you put in those seeds or have those pathogens, um, you need to get the temperatures up even higher. Um, we recommend at least 130 degrees for three days um, to kill those things off. And I'll be quite honest, it is hard to get it there, especially if you're having lots of people add things in. Um, so that's why it's best to kind of err on the side of caution 
with invasive species or things of uh, like if you have a disease plant where it's like a something that could um, I know there's sometimes there's a plant virus and stuff that it won't even yeah. if it gets to a temp it won't kill it yeah especially on the community level these are things that you might not think of but you definitely need to um, for those of you who have composted before you'll probably know that you'll oftentimes have a pepper plant or a tomato plant or some kind of small vegetable growing out of your compost. And the reason is, is, you know, you didn't get the temperature up to kill off those seeds. And it's also in this incredibly nitrogen rich material. So it's going to, it's been supercharged down there. Right. And so it grows like that. Um, so that's just kind of an overview on composting. Um, there's a lot more to it for sure, but we're not, we're just kind of glossing over some of the basics in, in this in this webinar today. Um, I put in a couple events, um, just I didn't realize I had this in there, but you know, this is an example of one of our community composting projects that we do. We do a lot of events around extension where we encourage food waste collection. Uh, we educate, you know, high school students there at different events, and we just we just pack it in mulch big bins like that and we let it sit and as long as you get the right materials in there um it's going to break down and i actually overpack those in mulch just so i don't have any trouble with with anything getting in there i've only had one problem with our our programs and i'll say it was because of eggs um i went and something had specifically got in there there was probably five or six dozen someone had cooked breakfast in the morning and threw that in for one of the teams and, and something got in there and got it out so that's why i always say be careful so to sort of clarify on the what you were mentioning earlier when we were talking about composting eggs, we're talking more about composting eggshells, not so much an unused egg that went right. that is past the date and not cooked eggs. We're Correct. talking shells. Eggshells are okay, and I, even then, I would I would probably just do a quick little rinse off. And, and some people like to crush them up because depending on how quick the rest of your compost is going, yeah. Yeah, that's really what happens. If you ever just take your hands and kind of go like this with the shelves, that's what they're going to look like in six months. Well, no, because... <laughs> so, um, Randy, do you can you look in your chat and see if you have any questions about composting? And I like some of your new slides, by the way. Um, I think we're good. I, th I don't really see too many in there. We kind of... Um, just seen some reasons why a couple of people are starting the garden, want to compost, they want to use it to amend their soil. And we kind of talked a little bit about rodents, pests, and things like that. So when we talk about um, steps to implementing a community garden, uh, you do want to reach out to check on any kind of local ordinances um, or anything like that that might impact your permission to have a garden. Um, and sometimes they may not be restricting growing edibles or something of that nature. But if you're having like a group activity where maybe you need parking space or water access, something of that nature, it's good to reach out and check with your um, with your local extension office. They may be familiar with those ordinances and if there's any rules um, where you can reach out to your, your county or city and ask um, and they can connect you. So you want to, and when we talk about steps, we talk about that briefly and then how to go about selecting a location and what resources and people. Uh, you may want to have. So like we just said about checking on ordinances, um, and in Florida, um, the, the municipality can't dictate where you grow your vegetable plants. Um, so, uh, but you may live in an in a association that has um, some option to restrict your growing. So it's good to check on that level as well. Um, you may also have some restrictions on your watering. Uh, usually vegetables, you have um, a little bit more leniency for growing vegetables and using water and fertilizer. Um, but being in Florida, um, and like you mentioned with our sandy soil, uh, things can leach through. Um, is, and so you wanna build up your organic matter so you don't need to water and fertilize as often. And that way it's not just going out into our water table. So here, oh, um, both our community gardens folks are hand watering. Um, that's basically to pres preserve the pumps because there's multiple people and then that way um, we don't have to worry so much that something might be running, running, running and, and kill a pump. Um, if you're gardening at home, you might be using like a drip or a low flow. Um, and with your, because with your vegetables, you're not wanting to get the, the foliage all wet anyway. So um, they're, 
you can definitely be Florida friendly and, um, and when you're watering your vegetable plants. Uh, and one of the perks of hand watering is you're getting people out in the garden regularly because um, in Florida we do have some pests and disease and so it's really good to be out checking your plants over anyway and then harvesting in a timely fashion. So yep, cover that. So when you're evaluating what space you may want to use to have a garden, um, whether this is at home or out in the community, you're going to pay attention to the boundary. Um, I don't advocate taking up all, as, as much as we'd like to think bigger is better, I don't necessarily say you want to push all the way to the edge of a boundary because you can't really control what the neighboring property may be doing, um, what they may plant that may shade you, um, and um, if there's anything that can go downstream into your area and also if they spray anything to, to keep the area clear. So, um, so look up and around. Sometimes you may need to have a truck come in and bring in materials and you need the, the truck to be able to lift up. Um, and so you wanna just fully look around in your space. Um, and maybe you have a small tree here and there, but in 10, some of our community gardens are 20-ish are years. Um, and there may be a tree very close to a fence. Or in it. So, um, so you want to pay attention to those boundaries. Um, make sure you're not downstream from dumpsters, dog kennels, that type of thing. Uh, you want at least a good six hours of sunlight. You don't need that in every single plot, um, but at least a good six hours. And our sun tends to be, I want to say, is it in the southern sky in the um, in the winter months? So uh, when our day is shorter. And let's see, like we already talked about taking note of any vegetation in the area. Are there invasives that, that are going to be encroaching? Um, there was, a, and there's a slide later on, there was a homeowners association. They actually removed, I want to say, almost two and a half acres of invasive plants and replaced it with Florida butterfly and also um, a small uh, that the residents had, had asked for. So, um, so if you do have invasives, um, so good opportunity to make use of that space replace it with something else. Um, in, if you're in Florida, I can't speak to other states, but if you're in Florida, we do most of our growing in the dry months. And so you do need to have access to potable water. Um, and then storage is really gonna vary depending on what kind of, how big is the space. If it's just a few small raised beds, you may only need a deck box uh, with some hand tools. Um, but if you're going bigger than that, you may need a shed uh, to store equipment. Um, and you can use graph paper to, to sketch things out. Um, and sometimes if you're out in the field, you know, some stakes, some string. And before we get too much into, where does the garden go? You want to stop and ask yourself. Who's gardening? Um, so, <laughs> so basically if you're the only person interested in having a garden out in your community, um, and there's no one else interested, you're basically wanting to build a farm. Um, so it's important to kind of reach out, find out who wants a garden, um, who's going to be on your team and help create that space. Um, I can say the community gardens that we do have are very much volunteer driven. Um, and it usually takes a team because people have different skills and talents and strengths. Um, and you don't want to go it alone. So, so we talked a little bit about things to consider when you're picking out your location. Um, and then when you're trying to find out who has interest in a community garden, um, how do people in your community communicate? Um, sometimes people get on different um, social media platforms, um, like there's neighbor pages or something like that. Um, maybe they're using Facebook and Instagram, and they can, maybe you have a community center with a bulletin board. Um, maybe it's just word of mouth when you're out walking your pets. Uh, but how do people in your community um, contact each other? Um, is it through your schools, through your churches? Um, and see if you can survey or assess people through those communication means. Um, and then consider starting small and expanding out as interest grows. So when we talked about the steps to implement a community garden and some of the resources, 
So resources can be anything from the people that you need um, to put it in place because you're creating a physical thing. So you do need people. Um, and then also uh, funding uh, for some of the resources. Uh, so like in this picture, there's speaking of strengths. So that image of um, five a day, the organic way painted on the shed in one of our community gardens, it was one of the community garden members that is, you know, she's just a gifted artist. And so that's how she chose to uh, to contribute to um, that community garden space and beautify it. So. Um, so you do want to encourage people with different skill sets. So some people are tech savvy, like today. I would not have been the person setting up the owl. So thank you, Randy. Uh, not, we haven't got through it yet. I'm getting getting <laughs> to try something new. Um, so you want somebody with people skills, hopefully someone with plant skills, so that way they can help with um, setting up that space and identifying what you need. Um, and sometimes it's people that they like to cook. And so when people are growing things, they're going to have suggestions on how, how you can go about eating it, because I know we get questions of like what to do with okra and, and things of that nature. Um, people that are handy with carpentry, plumbing, always, always in demand. And I'm very fortunate some of our garden leaders are retired um, engineers, and they're quite handy. So locally, we have, uh, because our gardens are in our parks, they have access to Friends of Sarasota County Parks. Um, which gives them like 501c3 status if they need to raise funds um, to, to create a space. Um, and so if you're outside of our community, you definitely want to touch base um, and see, is there something similar where you live? Um, and, uh, or can you, um, the, the location that you'd like to build it, like is it at a community center or something like that where they already have that status? So I would visit other gardens to get ideas. Um, and if you can't go physically, then um, I would do some searching online. And we're gonna have a virtual, a shared spaces virtual tour of our community gardens of imagery and things of, um, I think in August or September. And last but not least, um, one of our biggest gardens, which was quite an undertaking by the volunteers that created it, um, they can't speak highly enough of things like Gantt charts, which kind of helps you create that timeline and track people and keep you on track for what needs done and when. So uh, my main tip is try to keep it as fun as you can. Um, it's going to be hard work, but if you keep it a positive atmosphere as much as you can, thank people when they do participate. Sometimes if people come out and pull five weeds, um, they don't necessarily know why they showed up that day, um, but they might not understand if there wasn't a group doing that, that it would have been one person out there for much longer um, getting a backache. So um, keep it positive. Thank people for what participation they can give. Find ways to encourage more participation and proactively communicate um, and, and just try to keep that as joyful as you can. Um, I know the gardens that I've seen where they've had successful work days, um, it's because they incorporate some sort of um, social engagement. They enjoy spending time together and getting a chance to chat beyond just the physical work. So some of our um, local shared spaces, uh, I wanted to share some that are even outside of our community gardens. Uh, in case you live in a development where you're interested in creating a space uh, where you live. Um, the top left is the one that I mentioned earlier where they removed acres of invasive species and they were able to put in um, something that the residents had been asking for for a while. And that was uh, a mini orchard of fruit trees. And then right below that, you can see the sign that they use and on there they'll put recipe ideas. So if it's a fruit that people are unfamiliar with, they can find out, you know, how would I go about preparing this? That way they don't waste it um preparing it in a weird way finding it tasting a different way than they wanted um so uh, they're preventing that food waste by um helping them determine is it right how do you prepare it um telling them more about the plants that are there and that little table that's when they that's where they put the produce that's ready to to be shared out um and they can fold it up and down uh, pretty crafty people there and that's what i'm talking about as far as your resources in the community that was a resident that lives there who's a member in one of our community gardens as well um, just crafty and good problem solver so and then that down on the lower right is one of the gardens that's actually in a 
a development in, um, I want to say, North Northport, South Venice area. And they basically, they assessed, they were building out that development and they had asked the people living there, what do you want? What amenities are you looking for? And of course, things like the dog park showed up but also a community garden. And so they have a wait list and they have a, a sizable garden club and a lot of interest in that space. So locations in Sarasota County, for those that live in our area that wanna know more about the community gardens, maybe they wanna um, have an opportunity to see it um, or want to join one or um, learn more about them. We have one in Bayou Oaks um, within the city of Sarasota, uh, very close to the airport, uh, Bee Ridge Park, uh, which is one of our neighborhood parks and um, right next to the ball field. Uh, Culver House, which is in one of our nature parks. Uh, Buckin Airport Park out in Inglewood. Um, Laurel in Nokomis. And the War Mineral Springs in Northport as well. And I want to say at least three of those gardens have been operational for over 20 years now. So, um, which is a long time in the life of a community garden. Our fee is $25 for the year. Uh, we try to keep it really palatable. Um, so it's accessible to, to folks living in our community. Um, primarily edible, preferably vegetable, because uh, when you put fruit trees in a pot, uh, you get root encroachment mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing. You can shade out your, your neighboring members. So, and it's always good to promote health. All right, composting goes right along with community garden. I actually think very much so. the um, Pelican Co. contacted us recently about comp composting and setting something up there, but I could be wrong, but I think they did the other way. That's where they were at. Um, and you know, community composting is right, goes hand in hand with the community gardens, right? A lot of those same steps that uh, are in place are kind of kind of balanced this, along with community composting. And, and why do it? It's a lot of those reasons like we've already talked about, to improve the soil health, um, to utilize into your community garden if you have one as well. Um, you know, it, it, it helps to kind of divert uh, items from the landfill. So a lot of those same reasons that we've already kind of discussed. And just kind of, we're going to go through a couple steps real quick. Just I want to make sure we get through this and have uh, some time for questions and, uh, at the end. But, uh, you know, there's step one. You need to get that buy-in and permission. You need to create a team. And then you need to have, just like the garden, uh, a good location and uh, one that works and makes sense for putting it into place. Uh, I'll start with that first part. And I think this is probably true with the, the gardens as well. It's you have to have a good partnership with the neighbors and the community that you're involved with, um, you know, to make it work. You know, it's just like anything, uh, whether you're creating a green team for a business or a green team for your community, um, really everybody needs to be on the same page um, with what's going on, the, the, the steps to, uh, you know, participate and who's going to take care of this stuff. You know, if it all falls on one or two people, you know, the, the, the sustainability of, of the pro program and project uh, is, isn't going to be so great. I would imagine probably more so than uh, if you're doing a garden, but composting is kind of along those same way. And things that you're going to have to establish with these teams is, you know, whose responsibility is it to, to monitor the bins? You know, or is it everyone in the community or is there a select few? Um, you know, what times are of the week? How often are you going to do it? Um, when the compost is ready, you know, who's going to put some signs on it that says this is done and we need to move on to the next one to kind of make, make sure you have a good system in place. Um, another thing you're going to need is, is um, you know, what about the browns? You mean you're, you're always going to need more brown material to balance out that food waste. And, you know, a fun thing to do, too, is just kind of monitor the temperature and make sure it, that, that uh, it's starting to break down correctly, turning the compost. So these are all the things that you really need to think through and discuss. And I'll give a couple examples of those here in a minute. Uh, the first part, though, is uh, and I go out to a lot of different communities. And and first thing that we always run up against is, is the bin selection, right? Um, the tendency is to get a tumbler control bin. Um, but all of the systems work. And so I just want to do a little video and see if it works here with the owls. It's more for a, my tech, tech thing. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome back. One of the biggest questions I get is what type of bin should I use? So there's lots of different types of bins out there. Some of these contain bins that you can spin and that are on stands. There are other ones that are open 
bins just kind of freestanding with the opening up. So I wanted to kind of take you in depth and answer some of those questions here in this short little video as we go through each one of these. I'm actually going to bump ahead. Uh, see, Mindy jinxed me there. Uh, the, the internet connection is really wonky and the sound's not working too good. But you can see a few of those bins there and the different kind. Um, I would say most folks, um, when we look at those bins, you can see in the picture there, they're drawn to those tumblers that are on kind of the right side of there on the screen. And the main reason is is because they believe they're contained. It'll keep the pest out and things like that. Well, well, the tendency, two things happen. Number one, they fill up really quickly, right? You gotta, you gotta think there's a lot of people participating. And number two, uh, uh, many people do not turn the bin. So they put their food in there. The next person comes, opens it up, and all kinds of, I know someone put in the chat, food scraps with fruit flies and eggs and things like that on them. Um, those are gonna come right up at the next person. So they, they tend to be a little bit problematic. Um, I know why they don't turn them. And if they're heavy? Yeah, if you, like, I know one of the gardens, if it's over like a quarter to a third full, um, you have to have a lot of muscle, if not yeah. like one person. But yeah. it makes beautiful compost, I will say. It does, it, but it's, they're, they're just, they oftentimes run into a lot of issues there off the beginning. And the reason is, as I kind of alluded to, is the weight. So if you're in a small garden or community and you have, you know, 20 people participating, We've done a study here in Sarasota County where we had everybody uh, weigh their food waste and provide us data. It was a residential composting study using the geo bin, the open bin there. Um, and we found weights to be just under 20 pounds of compostable food waste per month by each household. You know, and that could have been a one person or a four person. It was a real hodgepodge of information. So if everybody is putting in, you know, that amount every month, at multiple times, it really is going to add up quickly. 20 people, you're going to have close to 400 pounds of food in that bin, and it's going to be full almost immediately. So the scalability becomes a problem really quickly. But, you know, if you're interested in doing that, that that's part of the process. It's just part of the learning curve. Um, and oftentimes, they'll just kind of adjust and get more bins and things like that. But uh, it usually takes a little bit while to kind of work through that, that on the scalability of, of the program. And that happened at this site here. Um, this is a large condo association I work with. I mean, two big towers. Um, they bought a small bin um, and it quickly filled up each side. And just the one. Just the one. Oh. Yeah, but they started small. They started with only, you know, eight to 10 participants. But oh. they quickly found that more people wanted to participate. And many people who were not signed up to participate were participating as well. Um, so we've got them going with a few more bins over there and things have smoothed out very nicely. Um, but, you know, really kind of deciding on the location and the type is a big part of it uh, that fits the amount of people that you have. Now, if you're doing it in a garden, you have a lot more open space. Um, you know, you can put maybe a couple more bins. Um, when you do it in a condo association, uh, HOAs come into play, a lot more rules. So, that you know, each, each place is on its own. You almost have to approach these um as individual kind of case studies for each one depending on the type of place and location um, and that goes along to this kind of developing a plan for participation uh, building the piles and, and harvesting kind of the piles there um, i mentioned earlier we do those classes black gold that's us there out building piles and doing stuff pre-pandemic so we'll be out, back out there doing that in the florida heat we're going to start it in hot humid weather see who really wants to learn to compost here soon we have um, garden renewals in the middle of summer. Yeah, so the other thing is, is signs. I love putting signs of either open or closed, maybe a green or a stop sign, go sign, something like that. Um, and, then, and then also the education component for everyone participating. Here's what is acceptable. Here is what is not acceptable. Um, and as you go through in, in a few weeks or a few months, you might notice that you're receiving a lot of a certain kind of item from a problem neighbor, maybe, or somebody, right? Um, so you may have to find a way to subtly say, hey, you know, we don't want 
X item in there is kind of causing a little bit of trouble. And those, those can be you know, interesting conversations sometimes. But the signage is very important to let people know this is an open compost. This one's closed. We're letting it cook and break down. So getting kind of that step uh, process in place. So you're definitely going to need more than one bin. I, I, I would say I love the simplicity of how you label the bins. Because I've seen <laughs> I've seen sometimes where there's multiple labels and yours are very, very yeah, I know I, where I, I can put Yeah, something. I like the kind of the open or the color coded, just it, it, too many things. People people don't really read them too much. Do this too much. <laughs> That's kind of like kind of like me with my emails. If it's longer than three sentences, I kind of space So you're it. saying I you don't read my emails. I kind of space out a little <laughs> you just bit. <laughs> Uh, but really, that's it. It's you really need to develop that plan. I know we're kind of pressed on time, so I'll, I'll just kind of bump ahead. But, you know, finding the right methods to collect your food waste and, and the right types of food waste and getting everybody on the right page. We need to develop the right amount of bins and scale it correctly um, and allow people to follow an easy system, right? Open versus closed. Um, you, you need the composting team. You need to decide if they're going to be the ones adding the brown or if people adding the food need to add in the browns and turn it. So there's some discussion there um, based on, on what you think most people's level of participation is. I think at a community garden, probably people will be more inclined to do the you browns know. and water and things like that versus if someone's just driving out of a condo, they're going to want to dump it in and maybe go. Um, and then when you're done, you know, who's going to screen the compost? Who's going to kind of go through and, and break the compost down and, and apply it back to the areas around, around? So kind of making those decisions. So those are the, for the residents. Composting team will most likely do those. And maybe the residents will do that part too. We'll see. And then, of course, everyone gets to enjoy it. Look at those graphics, huh? Pretty fancy. That's about a tech tech as I can get on my graphics there. Um, in certain communities that, that we've had around here, we've had some cool, uh, really cool uh, participants. You know, we've done several schools and worked with them and some of their gardens. Uh, one of the most unique ones we have is Yusepa Island, which is an island off the coast. There's not that many people who live out there, but there is a hotel. Um, so everything they produce, waste-wise, they have to haul off by a boat, you know, put on a... Uh, like a pontoon boat and take it off. So they started composting with a soft launch with just a handful of families. Uh, they have scaled up tremendously. They, they now have multiple, multiple bins. They're doing vermiculture as well. And the staff at the restaurant is now participating. So it's kind of kind of really taken off and, and, and done really well. They have to worry about raccoons out there. You know, they run around that island. That's one of their best. So they have to be very careful. Uh, and make sure they pack it in. They didn't find a way to put the raccoons on the pontoon and send them back. No, there's those, they, those raccoons are all, but they're not there because of the compost. No. They're there because of the, the trash bin actually at the, at the hotel and things like that. And they're on an island, so. Yeah, yeah. And so they're, they're into that, but they have the geo bin, the tumblers, and they're using worms. So they're, they've got a complicated thing, but they don't want meat, dairy. They've had problems with the coconut husk that don't break down in there. The larger things, and they had some folks who were putting bones in there. And, and pineapple and, tops. You know, sometimes you have stuff that, you know, and, and I, I like your point that a lot of times, like with the teams, it'll evolve. So some of the signs and some of the communications will alter depending on Yeah, you and you're always going to see those, those kind of items in there that won't break down. Sometimes there's a, like, those or like a whole plant. A whole <laughs> plant. You know, you might have to remind people, look, we, we don't want those items in there related to that. So create that sign, put it in a newsletter. Uh, just all about education with everybody there. Uh, with that, I think that's all we had today. And thank you for coming. Hopefully it worked. I like that we're both on the screen. Yeah. It's pretty cool uh, to be able to kind of share the webinar like that. We probably should have been doing this a long time ago with our joint one. Like that. I'm just excited to like be sitting next to you as a, <laughs> as a live person as opposed to seeing my own face talking yeah. about myself right now. Yeah, we're, we're almost like... Uh, was it Ryan and uh, Kelly in the morning there? You know, where we got our little divider in the middle here. We're actually far, far away now. <laughs> and our right. email's on the screen if you need to reach us. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.